we really can't talk about the French Revolution without talking about another world-changing, world-historic revolution, and that is the Haitian Revolution. And it's not, it's not just because you know both revolutions were happening at the same time or that we don't want to privilege a European revolution over one made by enslaved Africans. We need to talk about them together because these revolutions were inherently linked with each other and they fed off each other. And if we're going to talk about the Haitian Revolution, we can't do that without talking about one of the greatest works of history I've ever read, which is The Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James, a great intellectual and political activist from the island of Trinidad. And he wrote this book in 1938 when he was fully immersed in the Marxist movement as a Trotskyist to be precise. And I see it as part of a trilogy of incredible Marxist histories that are beautifully written. So you had the history of the Russian Revolution by Leon Trotsky in 1930. You had Black Reconstruction by W.B. Du Bois in 1935. And then you have Black Jacobins written in 1938. And these works are reflective of an age when global capitalism was in crisis and Marxism was seen by many great intellectuals as a critical tool for understanding social and political history. And in this segment, I can't really do justice to the entirety of the Black Jacobins as a book or the Haitian Revolution as a whole. But I do wanna highlight the central thesis James made about the nature of the Haitian Revolution and how it was intimately tied up with the same ideas of modernity and enlightenment that powered the French Revolution. Haiti was arguably France's most important and profitable colony, and it all came through the sugar plantation. James saw the sugar plantations as a contradictory force. On the one hand, it was a barbaric force, subjecting Black Haitians to the worst kinds of brutality. But on the other hand, it was a modernizing force and it exposed Haitian slaves to a very modern form of social organizations. James compares the sugar plantations in Haiti to modern industrial factories. Haitians lived in a greater concentration than urban proletariats. The food they ate and the clothes they wore were impor imported, meaning they lived in a modern life dictated by international trade. And just like the conditions of industrial capitalism created for industrial workers, would be reflected back in the way the workers organized. For James, the plantation system made its victims into modern proletariats, and they use modern organizational methods to overthrow that system. The sugar plantation was directly affected by international political developments. Enslaved Haitians paid close attention to these developments, and white French slave owners talked openly about the French Revolution in front of them, thinking they were too stupid to understand what was going on. But they did understand, and they were deeply moved by what was happening in France and the ideas of freedom that inspired it. And as we usually see with revolutions, the logical next question is, why can't that happen here? The first rising of Haitian slaves was in 1791. And from then on, what happened in Haiti played a big role in what happened in France. And it's not a coincidence that it was at one of the highest points for the left in the French Revolution in 1794 that the French assembly declared that enslaved Africans everywhere should be free. Now, James had some other points to prove as well with this book. At the time he wrote this, he was beginning to establish connections with figures in the West Indies and Africa, and had started to plant the seeds of the anti-colonial movement that would come throughout the 1960s. Part of what this book does is to demonstrate what a monumental achievement the Haitian Revolution was and the ability of colonized people to resist and defeat empires anywhere. Haitian Revolution defeated the Spanish, the British, the French army, who all tried to retake the island into their own possession. The French General Leclerc said in a letter to Napoleon, we in France have a false idea of the country in which we fight and the kind of men we fight against. The historian of the British army, John Fortescue said, that 1798, which was the year in which the British army was decimated by the Haitians, was the most disgraceful year in the history of the British Empire. But in the Jack Black, Jacob uh, Black Jacobins, James brings to light another contradiction about the revolution and its leader, Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint was born a slave, and through his organizational genius, he rose to be the accepted leader of the revolution. His strength was his unshakable belief in the enlightenment ideals of freedom and liberty. But this was also his downfall. Despite the fact that Napoleon had invaded Haiti and was trying to retake the island, Toussaint wavered and still thought he could negotiate his way out. He believed so much in the French Revolution that he didn't think it was possible that they could betray their own ideals. And James writes in the Black Jacobins, 
Toussaint could not believe that the French ruling class would be so depraved, so lost to all sense of decency as to try to restore slavery. His grasp of politics led him to make all preparations, but he could not admit to himself and to his people that it was easier to find decency, gratitude, justice, and humanity in a cage of starving tigers than in the councils of imperialism. Toussaint was captured, he was sent to France, and he died in prison cell. But the revolution would go on, and slavery was never fully restored in Haiti. The Black Jacobins is so important because it proves the absurdity of the notion that universalism can only apply to white Europeans or white Westerners. The Haitian Revolution was universalism and internationalism carried to its fullest and truest extent. Just imagine how confused French soldiers must have been hearing black Haitian soldiers, many formerly enslaved, singing the Marseillaise. But it wouldn't have been confusing if they understood that the Haitian revolutionaries believed in universalism more than the French ever could. And despite being called by some the father of Pan-Africanism, CLR James was always clear that rejecting Western civilization wholesale was never the way to go. Listen to a clip from him uh, in an interview of 1970 he did about his book. I use the Greek classics because the basis of Western civilization is the work of the Hebrews and of the Greeks. Everybody understands that. So in studying the race and the radicalism of race, I take examples of the radicalism of the Hebrews and the radicalism of the Greeks. I am happy to do the story of Moses because he was the first that we know of who led a suppressed people to freedom. So if you're talking about freedom and the release of a suppressed people, I begin with Moses. That is what we are rooted in, particularly in the United States and in the Caribbean. We are rooted in Western civilization. So we cannot ignore African civilization. We do the best we can to be in contact with it. What series of talks, I deal with Mau Mau, I deal with uh, Nkrumah, etc., the emergence of Africa. But I say we have to be aware of where we have come from. We cannot uh, deny the roots of Western civilization and the radicalism that we find in it, we absorb and take it to ourselves. So that I think we have a lot to learn because we both Western and African civilization, we of the black people in the Caribbean and in the United States, we touch civilization at two points, and in all my work, I try to be aware of them. Both the Haitian Revolution and the French Revolution have a special place in the heart of the left. And you may have noticed that in Jacobin's design is not a Frenchman, but an homage to the Black Jacobins. And I think Jacobin's creative director, Romine Forbes, articulated better than I ever could the meaning of the Haitian Revolution. He wrote, the Haitian Revolution encapsulates the historic mission of the left. That is the truest realization of the enlightenment, that those ideals wrested from the hypocrites who hawk them and seized by the wretched of the earth can become a radical project for human emancipation. Marx saw through the contradictions. His was both a critique of enlightenment and a project to expand enlightenment ideals of political emancipation into a project for genuine human emancipation. And so sounds off the, his, the left's history. It's the demand that those principles formalized in our political institutions extend to our lived experience in our social and economic life, in the home and on our streets. The history of the Haitian revolution should also serve as a reminder to those on the left who abandoning thoughtful critique can imagine no response to the contradictions of enlightenment other than absolute negation. Remember that line in the internationality, for reason in revolt now thunders. It was never a cry for a revolt against reason, but a harbinger of reason itself in revolt. And Jen, I don't know if you've ever read this work, and it's kind of interesting because I feel like recently Sailor James has kind of become popular again in the left or kind of like trendy, but I think for the wrong reasons. Um, and, you know, personally, I, I think he, he had a lot of interesting things to say. I don't think he really tells us much about our situation in the United States or what to do. But I think, you know, the history he wrote was great. What he wrote about West Indian society and if anyone's a fan of cricket, which I am, um, he has beautiful writings on cricket. Um, but, you know, I think Black Jackman's to me is one of the greatest uh, works of history I've ever read. Yeah, Black Jacobins is great. I could talk about Black Jacobins and the Haitian Revolution all day. Um, on the subject of cricket, much like the Enlightenment, the former British colonies are now so much better at cricket than England. And I think that rules. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has seen or should watch, we have in the documentary Fire in Babylon, which is about the West Indies cricket team um, and how 
you know, when they were ascendant in cricket was at the same time as their anti-colonial movements were blooming. Really great documentary. Um, so yeah, cricket's great. Big fan. <laughs> Um, I, I do want to mention uh, on the subject of the Black Jacobins and the Haitian Revolution, um, This I, I hope this is not controversial, but the one reason why I have never been super crazy about the famous Audre Lorde quote, the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house, is because I think you only have to look at the Haitian Revolution to show uh, why that statement falls short, right? I mean, as you pointed out in your segment, the Haitian Revolution was about seizing the promise of the Enlightenment uh, and really, really pushing those contradictions to the fore. And like, they did that amazingly. I mean, like, you know, CLR James, uh, it, you mentioned this in your talk as well. And CLR James in, in his book mentions, you know, the Haitian troops singing La Marseillaise, um, which of course is the French national anthem, but it's also been kind of, uh, since the French Revolution, a mainstay of I guess, liberation and resistance, right? Um, right? During World War II, I mean, that comes a little later, but during World War II, of course, the French resistance famously saying La Marseillaise uh, against the Nazis and the Vichy regime. Um, and and the, the story that, uh, I, I can't remember if it's CLR James himself or another historian um, who points out that, you know, as I said, the Haitian troops would sing La Marseillaise uh, when Napoleon's troops were kind of coming at them. And there was one famous battle in particular where, you know, the Napoleon's troops kind of start coming closer and they're like, what, it, like, what is that? And it turns out to be La Marseillaise and they're completely just like thrown into disarray. And I believe a few of them even lay down their arms. And, and um, one of them says something like, you know, we sang this song in France, in Italy, in Austria, and we always sang it as liberators. What the fuck are we doing now? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah. And what else is so great about this book? It's like it's it's really great example of what Marxist history actually means, you know, and I think if, if people have heard there's a lot of jargoning terms like Marxists use the word contradiction all the time. And I think sometimes you kind of just like don't even really know what it means. But I think this is a great example of like real mater materialist history and like the contradiction of the sugar plantation and the sugar trade of like what it did to Haitians, but it also put them in a structural mm -hmm. position to be able to carry out this revolution and do mm -hmm. it with modern organizational forms. Mm -hmm. um, that really, to me, it is a great example of like what we mean by Marxist history or a Marxist interpretation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, one last note about the Haitian Revolution and also the Audre Lorde quote. Um, I just thought of this, so like, please, no one get mad at me. <laughs> but when it comes to the Haitian Revolution, I really feel like, uh, you know, because Haiti was a slave society, they really did seize both the master's tools and the master's house, like quite literally, you know. And I guess, you know, when it comes when it comes to that phrase, like, I just feel like they're not just the master's tools. They're also our tools. You know, we can appropriate the tools or shall I say we can expropriate them um, and the house as well. So that's right. my and last thoughts on that. I sorry, I have to go one more last thought. But <laughs> yeah, please continue I mean, the metaphor since we're already. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it gets back to that uh, that recent episode on post-colonialism because it's again, it's like, why should we say it's the master's tool of like science or technology mm -hmm. or whatever? You know, like I or think the that's right. It's like ceding a lot of ground to kind of just accept that these things are not our tools as well. Mm -hmm.